Hello everyone. Um, my kids were saying the other night that someone ought to keep, uh, like, ought to make a compilation of all the times I say um. <laughs> You'd make a good TikTok. All right. So I'm Abe Stone. You can call me Abe or Professor Stone. I'm I'm fine either way. And uh, welcome to Philosophy and Legal Studies 144. And um, the so the official name of the course is Topics in Social and Political Philosophy, but uh, the topic, there's going to be one topic, basically, in social and political philosophy, and it is early modern political philosophy. So that's the name of the course on Canvas and the name of the course on um, the syllabus. And I'll explain in a moment a little bit more what that means. Um, yeah, this is the second time I've taught this course. The first time was a couple years ago. I, I, well, I don't know what the students thought. I felt like it went really well. <laughs> so I'm excited to teach it again. Hopefully I've made some changes. It'll be even better. Um, so uh, today, I'm not going to go the whole time. I'm just going to, first of all, go through the syllabus and handle whatever administrative matters there might be. Um, oh, is someone hearing some kind of noise? I don't hear anything wrong here. <laughs> I hope you don't have a concussion. Everyone's hearing it? Hmm. Don't know what we, let me make sure everyone else is muted. Uh, do that. Do that. Does that help? Still there? Did that help? I unplugged the fan. No, it didn't help. Uh, let's see which mic it's using. Okay, I switched to the built-in. Now it's gone? Okay. Hmm. I wonder what's making that happen with the other mic, but okay. All right, sorry, what was I talking about? Um, <laughs> I think I was saying uh, that I'm not going to go the whole time today because there's no reading to talk about yet. Um, and uh, so I'm just going to go through the syllabus and handle whatever administrative matters there might be and then give just a brief introduction to what the course is going to be about. So things always end up being less brief than I think they will be, but hope springs eternal. All right. So first, um, right. So this is my uh, main courses page. You can see the URL here up at the top, people.ucsc.edu. Should I write that down? 
It's on the syllabus. Of course, you won't have the syllabus unless you have this URL. <laughs> well, um, anyway, yeah, I'll write it down, just in case. No, wait, that doesn't... Okay, that doesn't make sense, because if someone went back to watch the video to see it written down, they would also see it written on the, on the URL bar. All right, so anyway, this lists all the courses I've ever taught, but um, the this one that I'm teaching now is at the top. There's the syllabus. There's also a PDF version. Oh, and by the way... You notice the assignments are already up here also in PDF and HTML. Um, so this is me. The best way to contact me is by email. Um, I try to check it at least a couple times a day when I'm teaching. So, I mean, you can't re expect instant response, but um, I used to be really bad about checking email, and in the days when I was really bad about, ch about checking email, I set up this thing. Let's see if this works. Oh, but I'm signed in as me. That's not what you were saying. Well, never mind. I don't know why it's screwed up. Anyway, this is a way you can send if you're on the list, which I added everyone in this class to the list. Um, you can send me. Uh, you can send a push notification to my phone, and it goes doo doo. <laughs> and you can send a very short message that way, like you know, check your email or something like that. So if there's something really urgent and you're not having luck getting in touch with my email, you could try that. Um, I am going to put a link to the Zoom meeting up here too. I didn't do that yet. And I will put a link to the YouTube playlist. So all the lectures are going to be recorded and um, and I put, I'm going to put them up in YouTube and add them to that playlist as quickly as I can. So that's not instantly. Uh, sometimes, it, sometimes it might be later in the evening. Sometimes it might be the next day. Um, but when they do go up, you'll be able to see them there. There'll also be a link next to the um, to the date of the lecture on the other part of the syllabus. Um, Okay, um, I need to make sure I can see the chat here in case anything happens in the chat. Right. So course requirements, it's pretty simple. There's going to be two short pa papers. Um, these are really just, um, they're closer to exams than papers in the sense that they're just questions that you write two to three pages to answer. You have a choice of questions. So the first one will be a choice of questions about the first few weeks of the readings, and the second one will be a choice of questions about the following few weeks of the readings. And then uh, at the end of the course, there'll be a longer paper um, and I don't know, is six to eight pages too long? Why do I always do this every year? I might reduce that. That's That might be too much. <laughs> All right, anyway, but it will be longer. <laughs> and, um, and that will be more of an open-ended paper. There's a, a list of suggested topics, although you can write about something else if you want that's relevant to the course. Um, and... Uh, Is there anything else to say about these? Um, oops. We have um, a, a grader for the course, Donovan Conley, who's a, now a master's student. He was formerly a philosophy undergrad at UCSC. Um, so uh, 
he's going to be actually grading the papers, but obviously in consultation with me. Um, and uh, so to see the paper assignments, you should go to one of these links. But to hand the paper in, you should go to the assignments tool on Canvas, and you'll see the place to hand it in. Um, and just please hand it in in some reasonable formats. Um, all assignments are due by 11.55 p.m. on the due date. Uh, it's not, I'm not actually like sitting there with a stopwatch waiting for the paper, you know, oh, it's 11.56, you're, you're, you fail or something. But people kept asking me what time papers are due. So I'm like, I don't know, 11.55. <laughs> so that's when they're due. Um, and this, I used to say very little about this on my syllabi and my assignments. I'm still not saying that much, but I'm saying more about it than I used to because they were... Uh, an unusual number of these plagiarism cases last quarter. I assume it has something to do. I know that for some people, distance learning really sucks. Um, some people do it better than others. Um, but uh, um, It's really like, it's not worth doing as it says here. Like suppose you feel like you can't write a paper because you don't understand the stuff well enough. So you're just gonna take, put together some stuff from Wikipedia and Stanford Encyclopedia or whatever and hand that in. If you put quotes around that stuff and you know, put a little text connecting it or whatever and footnotes, then of course you're not, it's not a good paper, right? I mean, you're not gonna get a good grade, but I, you know, I can pretty much guarantee you're not gonna fail. I don't fail papers very often, even if they're bad. In fact, I don't think I've ever failed a paper that was actually handed in except due to plagiarism. I don't guarantee I'll never do it in the future, but so far I haven't. So, you know, that would be a much better option than copying that same stuff in, you know, like changing the words so I won't find it with a search engine. But uh, I don't say that I always do, but I found plenty of them last quarter. So, um, because, you know, if because if if I I do take this seriously, I think that it's there's a lot of rules that are kind of stupid, but this rule is actually really important that you have to do your own work, um, and um, and if I catch you doing it, you definitely will get no credit for that assignment. Um, it might lead to you failing the class, and you know it will get reported to the authorities which uh, things of various severity can happen to you. Um, usually for a first offense it's not that it's such a big deal but you don't want to start on that path. All right and I do I have some links here in case someone's not clear about what plagiarism is. There's a whole bunch of resources here. I don't usually think the people who do it don't know that they're not supposed to do it. Um, I usually think maybe they don't realize how serious it is, but in any case, if you feel like you're not sure, you can ask me or you can look at these resources and you can also, if you wonder whether it's worth doing it, you can look at the academic misconduct policy <laughs> to see what the possible consequences of getting caught are. Um, Okay, I'm sorry about that. Like I said, in the past, I've barely mentioned this. I've basically just said, please don't plagiarize, you know, but uh, given what happened last quarter, I want to emphasize it a little bit more. Um, and as it says here, the, um, the, and as I already said, the lectures will be given at this time live on Zoom. Zoom, I really hope that people uh, will be able to attend that. I hate talking into a void. <laughs> um, I hope people might also ask questions in the chat. Um, uh, or you can unmute yourself and ask a question. People don't usually do that, but you can. Um, 
but you know, if you can't make it or like if your connection's not good enough or whatever, the lectures will be recorded and you can watch them on YouTube. Um, and these are the texts that I ordered for the course. Um, you can, the library uh, reserves managed to get uh, um, multi-user access to all of them. So um, in theory, you don't have to buy anything. You can just uh, use the library reserve page. Um, if you like having books, if you look behind me, you can see that I like having books. <laughs> If you like any books, you might want to buy them, or if you want to mark them up, or if you don't like reading on a screen, or um, numerous reasons. Um, there's also uh, public domain versions of all these texts that I have links to here, and also um, um, LibriVox, which, if you don't know what that is, it's... Uh, it's volunteers reading public domain works. So uh, the quality varies. Often it's actually very good. Sometimes it's not so good. <laughs> um, but um, so anyway, if I wouldn't necessarily recommend this, that for a first reading, although, you know, if you find you absorb information better that way, go ahead and try. Um, but okay so those are all alternatives um and there'll only be a few readings that are not from these books and they um there's already links to that they're already up on canvas okay are there questions about any of that or anything related to this um I know some people are still trying to get into the course. I'm not sure whether, I've already let in a few over the limit. Um, um, you don't wanna ask Donovan to grade a ton of papers. I'm considering just taking some of them myself and then letting more people in. So anyway, if you are still waiting to get in and you haven't been in contact with me, let me know, because I'm trying to get a hold on how many people that is. Um, okay. And the next page of the syllabus is just a list of the readings. And like I said, there'll be links to the lectures, right? So there'll be a link to tonight's lecture will appear here once I put it up. Um, okay. All right, so one more time, are there questions about administrative type matters? All right, so I'm gonna quit that screen share. And also quit my browser, because it slows my processor down. Okay. Um, Right, so like I said, the, the unofficial name of the course, I may someday get around to actually creating a course with this name. Creating a new course is a pain, so um, it's easier to use an existing course. But I may someday get around to creating a course with this name officially, but the unofficial name of the course is Early Modern Political Philosophy. So obviously this has two parts, early modern and political philosophy. So I'm gonna talk about political philosophy first and then about what early modern means. Um, so what is political philosophy? Well, uh, as people who have had courses with me before have heard this contrast before, it comes up in every course, but I'll put it up again. Philosophy was divided a long time ago by Aristotle first, actually, and then this was kind of renewed by Kant um, into two main parts, theoretical philosophy and practical philosophy. Maybe some other parts that don't fit, like aesthetics might be a third part or whatever, but anyway, I'm not gonna talk about that. So theoretical philosophy versus practical philosophy. Um, now, 
Um, you know, in everyday speech, we use a contrast like this between theory and practice, but, um, and although those words come from, you know, we use them to mean what we use them for because Aristotle used them. <laughs> um, but meanwhile, they've changed their meaning in our ordinary use. So like the way we ordinarily use these words might be something like, um, this is the example I always use for some reason. In theory, it might be good to build a bridge across the Atlantic Ocean, but in practice, it wouldn't work out, <laughs> right? So like what that really means is that uh, the theory according to which it would be a good idea to build a bridge across the Atlantic Ocean is not a very good theory, right? Like it's a theory that doesn't take lots of stuff into account, like how much it would cost, how dangerous it would be, you know, et cetera. Right. So, um, uh, oh, there are a bunch of questions here I didn't see. I'm sorry. Is it important that we use those specific additions? No, it's not important, really. Um, um, I mean, I will sometimes give page numbers from those editions, which would help you if you had that edition. But um, but these works were written, except for the Rousseau, that's a little bit of a special case. The rest of these works were all written in English to begin with. So there's no problem of having a different translation than I have. Um, uh, the Rousseau, yeah, if you have a different translation, it might be a little confusing. Uh, Different translations can be quite different. Philosophy is very difficult to translate. <laughs> um, so, uh, but in any case, as someone else already said on here, they're also all available by the through the library. Are they available through the public library page? Um, I think so. But I have a link in the syllabus to a library reserves page that has them all listed conveniently. Um, but yeah, I think you could also find them in the catalog because, like I said, these are all these are not single use licenses. So, like a whole bunch of people can be using it at the same time. I think, therefore, I think the fact that it's on reserve doesn't mean it's not available to other people. But I'm not 100% sure about that. Uh, okay, sorry, I didn't notice those questions. Okay, so back to theoretical versus practical, right? So, um, so in other words, by practical, we usually mean, uh, I don't know, like a theory that's in contact with the real world and real problems or something like that. That's not what this contrast means in Aristotle or in Kant. It's a contrast between different types of questions you can ask. One type of question you can ask is something like, well, what is true or false about the world or about other things, if there's other things besides the world? <laughs> um, what is, you know, what, uh, you're tr this is a question you ask when you're trying to gain knowledge. Whereas a practical question is a question about what we should do. So these are different questions. Now, I mean, obviously they're not completely, well, maybe this isn't obvious, uh, but it seems they're not completely independent of each other. If you want to know, should we build a bridge across the Atlantic, then you're going to want to answer all kinds of questions about like, how much would it cost to build a cross, bridge across the Atlantic, you know, et cetera. So, so the, the, the first question is practical. Should we do it? But the other question is theoretical. How much will it cost? So, I mean, these questions are inter interconnected in some way. Um, uh, but, um, but nevertheless, they are two different questions you could ask, and they correspond to divisions between different branches of philosophy. So um, theoretical philosophy, um, uh, 
Um, we often now think of the main parts of it as metaphysics and epistemology. Um, right? Metaphysics is, you know, the study of what kind of things there are, what kind of causes of things there are, questions like that. Whereas epistemology is the study of whether we can know anything and if so, how. <laughs> Um, so, um, uh, I mean, the word epistemology was invented in the 19th century, um, but uh, by a kind of um, Hegelian, well, more Schillingian uh, Scottish philosopher, but in any case, um, the study of what we can know and how we can know it is is certainly ancient. Um, so um, and there's other things you might want to count in there as well. Logic. Uh, I don't know. In any case, that's theoretical philosophy. Practical philosophy contains... according to Aristotle, ethics and politics, right? Those are the names of two books by Aristotle. Well, actually three books, because there's two ethics, but in any case, um, those are the names of books by Aristotle, ethics and politics. Um, he also thinks it has another part, which is about how to run your household, but never mind that. Um, uh, so um, ethics is basically questions about what we should do asked as individuals. What's the best way to live? Um, which things are uh, morally permitted, forbidden, etc. cetera? Um, politics is concerns practical questions asked on behalf of society. How should we organize human societies. Um, so, um, right, the word pol politics here comes from the Greek word polis. Right, a polis is, this is the word that's usually translated into English as city-state, <laughs> right? Like Athens was a polis. Um, um, of course, Aristotle knows that not everyone, not every human society is organized as a polis, right? He knows that there's an empire of Persia, for example. Um, but he thinks that uh, the, this is the natural organization for human beings and the best. <laughs> um, so the whole branch of practical philosophy concerning the setup of human societies gets called politics. Um, now, since nowadays we use politics, the word politics, to mean something else, right? Like people trying to get elected and stuff like that. It's not a branch of philosophy. <laughs> um, therefore, uh, we call, instead of politics, we call it political philosophy. But it's the same thing. It's Aristotle's science or uh, discipline of politics. Um, the Latin equivalent Polis, civitas, 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 or however you pronounce your Latin. Civitas is how I pronounce it. Um, so um, uh, you'll sometimes see our the philosophers we're reading referring to the civil state the civil law, right? That means the state in which people have some kind of political organization, the, the law that's, that emanates from the political um, uh, structure is the civil law. 
Um, in English, there are a number of equivalents for this in English, actually. The, in the period that we're talking about, at least in the early part of it, the, the usual English equivalent for this is commonwealth. Um, right? So when we see Hobbes right away talking about what a commonwealth is and why we have them and how they should be ruled and so forth, he's talking about that same political question. How should the polis or something that fulfills the function of a polis, uh, an empire, a kingdom, a republic, whatever it is we have, right? How should it be organized? So the main thing that all four of the philosophers we're reading are talking about, well, should I say that? In the case of Hobbes and Locke, the main point of their book is straightforwardly political philosophy. So the main thing they're talking about is um, uh, what are commonwealths or states? How do they come about? Um, what should they be like? Um, uh, what rights should their citizens have, their, what rights should their rulers have, etc. Um, Rousseau uh, is in the social contract, which we're, is the second thing by him we're going to read, um, is definitely also focused on that. The discourse concerning the origin of inequality is um, um, really aimed at somewhat different questions, but uh, these questions of political philosophy come up in it centrally. And Wollstonecraft, um, we're going to be reading uh, parts of her Vindication of the Right of Woman. So this is obviously about a political topic, um, but not all of the book is about political philosophy per se. Um, the parts that I've assigned either are about it directly or it comes up um, in an important way in them. Um, uh, either directly or can be inferred by contrast with Rousseau. Um, I'll talk obviously more about who each of these authors is and what they're getting at and so forth when we get to them. Um, um, but in any case, so that's the main focus of the readings, but this cannot always be separated from other philosophical issues, from issues of ethics, but also from all kinds of other philosophical issues, um, as we'll see. Um, okay, so that's the political philosophy part. Are there questions about that? Okay, so I'm going to talk about the early modern parts. <laughs> Let me solve this. Let me solve this. Yeah. That's kind of an inconvenient place in the middle of the board, but I'll leave it there. All right. So, early modern. What is early modern? Um, so, um, Philosophy is, you know, a little bit of a slow moving field, you know, like modern architecture maybe started in the 1920s or the 1930s, but modern philosophy started, depending on your count, in either the 16th or the 17th century. <laughs> um, right at the end of the Middle Ages, well, and the Renaissance, but, you know, whatever. A few hundred years here or there, what difference it make? Um, at the end of the Middle Ages, uh, modern philosophy started. Um, when was that? And which part of it was early? Uh, 
So, I mean, you might think that's kind of a joke question, but actually it has a rather precise answer. <laughs> um, but the answer is not necessarily the same in this course as it would be in 100B or 100C, right? So 100B and 100C are both about early modern. Oh, see, I shouldn't have erased that. They're both focused on early modern epistemology and metaphysics. Um, and for that, for like, for 100B, you might say that early modern philosophy begins with Descartes' meditations. Um, that would be 1641. And it ends with Kant's Critique of Pure Reason. And that's 1781. Right, so this would be early modern metaphysics and epistemology. Right, Descartes, um, Locke, Leibniz, Barclay, Spinoza, Hume, I didn't say them in order, and a bunch of other people are all early modern philosophers. And then, uh, um, Kant, as Moses Mendelssohn referred to him, as the all-destroyer, <laughs> right? He came into this and smashed it all up. That would be 100B. But for this course, um, so for this course, I think you would really want to say, and this shows one of the many limitations of the syllabus, actually, you would probably want to say that early modern political philosophy starts with Machiavelli's The Prince, which is not on the syllabus. It was a lot earlier than 1641, it's 1532. Um, um, why did I decide not to assign that? There just isn't time for it, I guess. <laughs> um, I mean, I couldn't do this, of course, without Hobbes, Locke, and Rousseau. Um, and I didn't want to do it with all dead white men. So um, uh, at least that was my original thinking between behind getting Wilson Craft in. Once I taught her two years ago, I realized that um, uh, I think she's actually pretty important to the course, and I've actually expanded, given her two more lectures this time than I did two years ago. But in any case, once all those people are in, there's no room for Machiavelli. Um, it's uh, it's probably a diff. It's a very different kind of work than uh, all of these. In any case, it would be probably more difficult to teach, but it is in the background of what's going on here. So all these people are thinking about it, um, beginning with Hobbes, which is what we're beginning with, are, you know, have Machiavelli in the back of their mind. Um, and it ends when, well, So the French Revolution was in 1789. Um, that's probably when I would have said it ended. Um, uh, unfortunately, that would mean that the vindication of the rights of woman couldn't be included because it was published in 1791. <laughs> so I'm stretching the definition a little bit. Um, but I think it wouldn't be unreasonable to say early modern political philosophy ends with Napoleon. <laughs> um, so we could stretch it a little bit past this. Um, so it's a period that begins with 
um, people starting to think new um, uh, new thoughts about how society should be organized, where political power comes from, uh, all the all these questions, um, and it ends with um, uh, old political structures being overthrown, basically, and replaced by new ones. Um, now. Uh, just as with every historical background I give to a course, everything I just said was a gross oversimplification, <laughs> despite all the caveats I put in there. Um, but um, but uh, that's basically like that oversimplified characterization is what makes this period of in this area of philosophy so important. Um, uh, of course, it's not clear whether the whole world changed because philosophers thought something different or whether they thought something different because the world was changing or some combination of the two. But at least from the point of view of philosophy, if we want to understand how we got to where we are, um, this is a, a critical time to look at. Okay. So that's the general history of, or meaning of early modern political philosophy. Are there questions about that? I should maybe also say, add this, that um, if you want to understand um, later political philosophy, um, then... Uh, um, people like Kant and Marx and Nietzsche and um, Rawls and uh, um, anyone else you can think of, basically, in, in the later part of modern philosophy who writes about any of these issues is thinking of these authors, except, unfortunately, that for obvious reasons, Wollstonecraft tends to be neglected. Um, I asked someone I know who's like a real Nietzsche nerd, basically, <laughs> um, whether Nietzsche ever refers to Wollstonecraft and is published or unpublished or anywhere, and he said he, he can't find anything. <laughs> um, but uh, um, and when I taught. Uh, last year, 19th century philosophy, and I taught the um, thought of Margaret Fuller, who wrote uh, Woman in the 19th Century. Um, she refers to Wollstonecraft mostly to talk about her marriage, <laughs> her marriage to William Godwin. Um, she's not interested in her ideas. Um, so, you know, that's a problem. There's a lot of injustice in the history of philosophy. I'm sure you're not hearing that now for the first time. But in any case, leaving aside that that uh, exception, you know, like that's another reason why these authors are so important. Because if you want to understand um, the later history of political philosophy, this is what people are reacting to. Okay, so that's the general introduction to it. Now, the other thing um, I wanted to do was to focus more on the history of England in the 16th um, and 17th century. Um, be, you know, again, all of our authors except Rousseau are, um, um, they're all English. That's true now because I, I had some one reading from Hume who was Scottish last time, but I cut that out. <laughs> so they're all English except Rousseau, um, and uh, there's you know various good reasons for that, but uh, they partly have to do with how much happened in uh, in 
the political life of England in the 16th and 17th century. So, um, um, I should say, I guess I'm not an expert on that. I'm not an expert on history at all. I'm not really a historian, uh, not even exactly a historian of philosophy, although I spend most of my time reading old philosophy. <laughs> um, uh, but, uh, you know, um, I guess, especially with this stuff, little by little, that knowledge of what actually happened kind of forces itself on me, whether I'm interested in it or not. I shouldn't say that. It is, it's fascinating, actually. If you ever had a chance to read Hume's History of England, I mean, I, uh, I'm sure you could read something much more up to date than that, but you probably couldn't read something better than that about the history of England. Um, in any case, that, that was what Hume was famous for in his lifetime, or at least that was what those, those were the books that sold the history of England. Um, all right, in any case, so I'm just going to put up a, a little timeline of this just to keep things in perspective. So the first thing is the Reformation, right? The um, uh, getting rid of the Catholic Church. So in England, I mean, it wasn't an instantaneous process. Why am I getting my foot cut? This it wasn't an instantaneous process, but uh, like pretty much the main turning point was 1534, Henry VIII. Now, um, I mean, I guess you might say, well, was that a political event? Oops, why did that suddenly go out of focus? Um, you might say, well, was that a political event or was that a religious event? Um, well, uh, both, right? And I mean, one of the main themes we're going to see in all these authors is the question of religious organization is, well, first of all, it's just internally, inherently a political question. How should the church be governed? Um, but it's uh, inseparable from larger political questions, right? How should the society be governed? Right? In, in getting rid of Catholicism, Henry VIII is um, eliminating a jurisdiction that the Pope has in England. Right, the right to appoint bishops, the right to have clergy tried under in special courts, uh, the right to levy taxes of certain kinds. Right, like the Pope had all kinds of political powers in England until Henry VIII kicked them kicked him out, <laughs> so to speak. Um, um, and a lot of the rest of the history of England in this period is both religious and political, right? Different parties are fighting each other and they're fighting both over who should be the king or whether there should be a king at all and over um, um, what is the right way to govern the church and who has the authority to do it. So um, I'm going to skip over a lot of stuff that happened after that. Um, and skip straight to the English Civil War, which was 1642 to 51. Um, Right. What happened before the English Civil War was, um, well, so um, basically 
there was a back and forth between Protestants and then Mary, uh, Queen Mary, who tried to bring Catholicism back to England and then um, back to Protestantism under Elizabeth. Um, and as each side took over, um, um, they uh, would have the supporters of the other side burnt at the stake and so forth. Uh, it was, you know, that <laughs> this is a terrible pun, but the stakes were high <laughs> in this, in, in this uh, conflict. Um, uh, and so what happened leading up to the English Civil War is that Charles I was uh, um, professedly a Protestant king, carrying on in the tradition of Elizabeth. Um, but uh, first of all, there were some suspicions about him that he might have Catholic sympathies. Um, but um, second of all, what was definitely true of him is that he favored an Episcopal polity for the church. Right, this polity is that same word polis. The church question of church polity is the question of how, what kind of hierarchy or structure the Christian church should have. Episcopal polity means there should be bishops. Um, Right, so and, you know that's uh, you can tell who won this in the end because to this day the Anglican Church, or as it's called in America, the Episcopalian Church, <laughs> has the Episcopal polity, right? But um, on the other side, well, the paper who followed the Presbyterian polity. <laughs> And they thought the church should be ruled basically by a combination of like ministered and elected ministers and elected elders of congregations. I don't claim to completely understand what the Presbyterian polity is, but it definitely involves no bishops, right? So, um, um, so you know, whether, whether Charles the first, um, really thought, you know, it would be okay not only to have bishops, but to have the Bishop of Rome be in charge of all the bishops or not uh, is not clear. But what is clear is that he wanted the church to be run by bishops. Um, and the Presbyterians, um, who are the same people we know as the Puritans, um, were uh, not happy about that. So the English Civil War, in some complicated combination, ended up being, on the one hand, a war between the parliament and the king over who had the right to uh, levy custom duties and various things like that is what it started with. Um, but it escalated quickly um, until uh, the king and the parliament fielded op opposing armies and started to fight each other. Um, but at the same time, in some complicated way, it was also a religious war over whether we should have an Episcopal or a Presbyterian church. Um, and the Scottish army, because Scotland was already under the control of Presbyterians, um, uh, came in and fought on the side of the parliament in the war, and that was one of the decisive uh, elements in the victory of the parliament. Um, so, right, so I guess, spoiler, I just gave away, the parliament won. Um, they captured Charles I, and they eventually executed him. At which point there was no king. Um, right? They put him on trial and executed him. And there was a period that followed that was called, now this is confusing, 
and in fact, some of our authors worry about this confusion too. It's not just my problem. There is a period afterward that's called the Commonwealth of England. Now, right? So, as I said, Commonwealth can be used in this general sense in which a kingdom is a type of Commonwealth. But when they talked about the Commonwealth of England, they meant as opposed to the Kingdom of England. It was no longer a kingdom. There was no king to begin with. There was still a parliament. Um, uh, eventually, Oliver Cromwell took over. And called himself the Lord Protector of England. Um, so the latter part of the Commonwealth period is called the Protectorate. It was basically a military dictatorship under Oliver, Oliver Cromwell. When Oliver Cromwell died, um, the, fel the fellow who succeeded him, who I don't even remember his name, but anyway, he wasn't around very long because um, people had basically, there, I think, had come to be a common sentiment that this was a mistake, that they shouldn't have kicked out the king. <laughs> um, and uh, so pretty quickly after Cromwell, Cromwell died, they invited Charles I's son, Charles II, to come back from France and become the king again. And that was the rest, that's called the Restoration. So the Restoration was in 1660. Maybe I should write Charles the first here. Now, so um, here's where we begin to overlap with our authors. Hobbes's dates, this board is so crowded that I don't think, no, I can write. Uh, oh no. Hobbes's dates are 1588 to 1679. And Leviathan was published in 1651. So, um, right in here, at the end of the British Civil War, um, Hobbes was in exile with Charles II in France. Hobbes was, was uh, belonged to the Royalists party, um, or the Tory party, as it became came to be known later. Um, and as will become obvious when you read his book, um, he thinks that this whole thing was terrible. Of course, I mean, he's writing it before all of these ha things happen, so I guess you should say he thinks this original act of Parliament fighting against the king executing the king and exiling his successor, that that was all a disaster. And one of the main motives, although it's certainly not the only motive, but one of the main motives between, behind all his thinking in this respect is um, how to set up a commonwealth such that things like this won't happen. They won't degenerate into civil war. So, and the way he thinks civil wars start, as we'll see, is, you know, is pretty much based on how this one started. It may not really even be that realistic as far as how most civil wars start, but it is definitely how this one started. Okay. Um, all right, so Charles II was, you know, uh, um, restored. The monarchy was restored under Charles II in 1660. Um, and then he was succeeded by his son, James II. And I'm running out of room down here.
James II ruled from 1685 to 1688. And um, this started already under Charles II, but it became to a fever pitch under James II. People again started started to suspect that these people were secretly Catholics and were and were planning to reimpose Catholicism on England. Um, when whatever may have been the case in 1534, I mean there was actually a lot of resistance to the Reformation in English England to begin with. Some people rebelled against it and whatever, but um, by this time the vast majority of the country did not want to return to Catholicism. Um, uh, although, you know, some did. <laughs> so um, uh, people were very frightened at this prospect. I mean, they remembered what happened last time Catholicism was reimposed. The Archbishop of Canterbury was burnt at the stake and so on and so forth. Um, so um, I think uh, it's now known that it's true that James II was secretly a Catholic himself. Um, it's less clear what his plans were, whether he actually um, uh, contemplated reimposing Catholicism and not tolerating Protestantism, or whether he just wanted to increase liberties for Catholics in England. Um, but in any case, the fear that people had was that he was going to reimpose Catholicism. And again, at the same time, there was a conflict between him and Parliament over how far the royal prerogative stretched. What, what authority does the king have, um, if any, in op opposition to parliament? Or is parliament really supreme? And that issue was basically decided by what's called the Glorious Revolution, so-called by the winners, obviously. <laughs> So uh, the Glorious Revolution was, well, obviously in 1688, because that was what ended James II's reign. This time they didn't kill him. It was, it was nicer times. They just exiled him. <laughs> um, uh, and they replaced James II with William, William III, but people you just, just call him William, or the William half of William and Mary. Right, so they brought William of Orange over from Holland, and his wife Mary, who was uh, that was his relation to the royal line of England, um, and uh, um, the Parliament passed a Declaration of Right, limiting the powers of the crown. Present and presented it to William and Mary before they would allow them to be uh, crowned, right? So that was the point at which British monarchs officially accepted that they were a limited monarchy. And again, one of our authors is involved in this. So Locke also went into exile at one point, in this case in Holland, but... Um, he went into exile because he was in the anti-royal party, or the Whigs, as they came to be known. Um, so, right, Locke's dates uh, are 1632 to 1704. And the treatises, uh, the two treatises of government, which we're going to be reading the second treatise, I'll say something uh, I guess uh, when we get to it about what the first treatise was, but the two treatises of government were published um, in 1689. Um, so in other words, the year after the Glorious Revolution when Locke came back to England, but they were mostly written in, uh, in exile. Um, so uh, um, 
to some extent they you know reflect the outcome of the glorious revolution but um but at least as Locke first conceived of them and wrote most of them they were more about the prospect of a revolution like this by the way, the reason, the reason Locke had to go into exile is that he was suspected of being involved in a plot to assassinate Charles II. I mean, sorry, James II. Um, no, wait, was it Charles II? Anyway, he was suspected of being involved in a plot to assassinate the king. Um, I think to this day it's not clear whether he really was involved or not. He certainly was associated with people who were involved, but he probably wasn't really involved himself, but I don't think anyone knows for sure. Um, okay, um, and as Thoreau says in Walden, almost the last significant piece of news from England was the revolution of 1688. <laughs> Or wait, does he say? No, I think that's the revolution of 1688, right? After this, uh, English political history is quieter. Um, but of course, we know that as the 17th and 18th century went on, things started to happen in other places, right? And um, we'll see... Uh, Wollstonecraft referring both to the American Revolution of 1776 and the French Revolution of 1789. Um, Rousseau died before the French Revolution. Um, his relation to it is contested, I guess, whether he should be seen as an important factor in bringing it about or not. Um, Okay, so that basically is my general introduction to the course. Um, and I will have more to say after we've read some Hobbes, but are there questions about any of that? Okay, well, so if not, I will end here and I'll see you on Thursday.